All right, welcome back. I'm excited to jump into one of my favorite topics on city climate change governance, which is green spaces. So we're going to ask ourselves two questions during this section. First is what do green spaces actually do and who has access to green spaces? Green spaces can help adaptation needs through a variety of ways. First, it can improve air quality. It reduces temperatures anywhere from five to 20 degrees Celsius, according to research, and also significantly reduces the likelihood of flooding. So especially for cities that have higher risk to flooding, um, green space installation can be particularly helpful in more vulnerable areas of the city. We're gonna take a look at um, ways that we can assess urban green spaces. So I have um, two examples here. The first we're gonna look at is Hanoi in Vietnam. Um, and so the author of this particular piece that did the assessment developed a key that has basically three levels of competencies. So the first is um, this dark blue um, that shows, says there's strong evidence of the competencies and the responses. The middle says that there's evidence of competence, but that there's challenges or limitations to green space um, in those particular areas. And then the final, that's light gray here, um, says that there's limited evidence of competence and responses. <clears throat> um, so starting um, with the dark blue, so in the data and knowledge row here, so this category, um, the researcher found, um, the researcher found that there is strong evidence of climate data for evidence-driven decision-making um, and um, we also see a lot of areas where there's evidence of competence, but there are some challenges and limitations. So, for example, the entire category of ethical and normative, Hanoi process, has processes to understand access to green spaces, has processes to understand vulnerability across society and space, has explicit consideration of justice in green space planning, and has measures to reduce inequalities. Um, and there's evidence of those things, but there are some challenges or limitations to it. Um, whereas in some other areas, such as societal collaboration, there's limited evidence of channels for public participation in decision making and effectiveness of participation on outcomes. So for example, in Fukuoka uh, in Japan, we see um, high strong evidences of things like data and knowledge, the same category that Hanoi had, but they also have um, strong competence and decision support tools for non-technical staff, policies and legislation plans for green spaces and presidents presence of leadership and champions. However, um, if we look at the ethical and normative area, there's very limited evidence that this city process has processes to understand vulnerability, has explicit consideration of justice, and has measures to reduce inequalities in green spaces. Um, and so there's, as you can see, there's a lot of different areas that we can actually use to um, understand and assess um, this balance between the effectiveness of green spaces. So um, using things like data and knowledge, having goals and targets and outcomes, um, as well as the um, impact of this from an equity perspective. So um, are those that are most vulnerable and marginalized able to access those green spaces and benefit from the effects of green spaces? Um, in Taipei, um, we see really high, strong evidence here of uh, competence and responses. So uh, very high societal collaboration in Taipei. Um, so approaches to support civil society collaboration, channels for public participation, decision making, and effectiveness and participation of outcomes. They also have um, strong use of climate data for evidence-based decision making. They have policies and legislation plans for adaptation, opportunities for innovation, um, experimentation, learning, presence of leadership and champions, and measures to reduce inequalities in green space and adaptation benefits. They do have um, more limited evidence when things, with things like linking green space and adaptation with the development goals, uh, explicit consideration of justice in green space planning and adaptation, um, mechanisms and effectiveness of integrating across sectors, scales, levels. <clears throat> Um, and so we can see that for these three cities, we have a lot of variance in areas of their strengths. So for example, Taipei is really strong with the societal collaboration. Uh, Fukuoka is uh, stronger with data and knowledge, and Hanoi is um, stronger in that like ethical normative pieces here. Um, and so this is a really helpful way for us to be able to assess areas of growth and improvement for green space governance, as well as um, know like what is working and who is succeeding in kind of what areas of green space governance. 
Um, equity in urban green spaces is really important for several reasons. So <clears throat> first, um, larger parks that can support urban forests, joggings, or biking, these are more likely to be located in wealthier, wider areas of the city. Um, so for example, the Monon Trail in, in Indianapolis, Central Park in New York City, Forest Park in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, there are also parks um, in poor and black majority neighborhoods, but they might be co-located near hazardous sites and may previously have been the sites of severe pollution themselves. Um, they also often lack upgraded amenities. Uh, lower income neighborhoods were more likely to have higher use density than lower income neighborhoods, uh, or than higher income neighborhoods, sorry, um, which means that uh, accessing and using that space um, is particularly more tricky, um, and oftentimes because they lack upgraded amenities um, and um, like there are fewer of them <laughs> located in um, higher income areas. Um, it also uh, creates kind of a cyclical effect with the higher use density. Um, additionally, parks and low income communities are more likely to contain basketball courts, less likely to have things like trails and less likely to have aesthetic features. Um, so we see um, some pretty big disjointedness in terms of the equity in urban green spaces. There are ways that we can address the green space equity. So first acknowledge it, acknowledging that not only green spaces are the same. Um, also prioritizing and co-planning with Black, Indigenous, and other historically marginalized communities. Um, uh, Public-private partnership versus community-owned can create both some opportunities and some challenges. So public-private partnerships um, are becoming a more and more common way for cities to finance the creation of green spaces. So these might be things like um, a, a, com a corporate building, um, getting some sort of um, city approval for zoning with the agreement that the green space, that they have to build a green space in their building and that green space has to be open to the public. There's actually a really interesting rabbit hole of TikToks where people are exploring um, kind of these like open, um, open gardens in different cities like New York City and things like that that people don't know exist. Um, that's also one of the challenges with the public-private partnerships is that um, sometimes these companies um, will uphold their end of the agreement, so they'll build the space, um, but they'll limit access to it either by having really limited hours or just not telling people that these spaces exist uh, versus community owned. Um, when these spaces are community owned, um, and uh, they can actually be um, you know, open in times where the community needs them. The community can advocate for, you know, additional amenities to be added to the park that meets the needs of the, the local community and people who use that park um, or that green space in general. Um, and um, it's driven a lot less by kind of corporate interests and a lot more by um, the residents of those neighborhoods themselves. Um, additionally, um, we can emphasize um, long-term inclusion versus short-term or project-specific inclusion. So, um, so for example, um, if we're only including Indigenous voices um, on this one project because we want to tick the box that, you know, we invited somebody from the Ute tribe to give us feedback on this, um, that is not actually inclusion. Um, inclusion has actual long-term partnerships. Also, inclusion means being comfortable and accepting a no from folks. Um, this is one thing um, that I think shows up a lot of times in green space discussions is that um, true inclusion means being okay if the community or the folks that you're including say no or push back against your efforts or ideas and accept that no as an answer, not just trying to persuade them to change their minds. So we need long-term partnership um, and long-term inclusion with all folks that are affected by green space policies in cities and not just like short-term filling the box or for, partic for particular projects. Um, and so this is a, a way in the long run that we can address green space equity issues. Um, when we come back, we're gonna talk about recycling. <laughs> 